Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath for those that it is the Sabbath. And of course, for some of us, it's not Sabbath yet. Um, we're going to continue reading from the Third Angel's Message, the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, and uh, A.T. Jones presentations that were done in 1895. And this is number 14. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the Sabbath that's coming, or the Sabbath hours, the fellowship that we can have. And we're thankful, Lord, for the blessings of the week, even the difficult things that we face that call upon us to rely upon you. And Lord, we need your presence every hour of the week, but we invite your special presence on the Sabbath. We can enter into the rest as we enter into your work, your righteousness each day. We pray, Lord, for healing for those that are suffering we pray, Lord, that you can help us in the struggles that we face as we live in this world of sin. And Lord, we are thankful for the truths that you have given us as Seventh-day Adventists and uh, the desire that you put placed in our heart uh, to study out the things in your word, especially, Lord, as they relate directly to our salvation. And so we pray that as we read from A.T. Jones, that you can give us a clear mind, uh, an understanding, a clear understanding of the words that we read. May your Holy Spirit speak to each one. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening again. And... Uh, these messages of Jones are getting very intense, as we noticed last week, dealing with the nature of Christ. And just to sort of recap, we know that this issue of the nature of Christ has been a controversy within Adventism. Even people who claim that Jesus had a sinful human nature don't necessarily understand what that means. Um, that is they believe that Jesus in some way uh, did not see himself as a sinner. And A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner are very clear that Christ knew he was righteous by faith alone. That is, he didn't have an internal testimony that he was righteous because he didn't see himself as righteous, but he was righteous. And so he's our example in that. We know that as we... Uh, seek to perfect a Christian character. We're going to see ourselves as sinful, not as sinless. And so people who claim to be sinless obviously are not. And, you know, we, I've seen people say that, you know, God doesn't tempt them anymore or Satan doesn't tempt them anymore. I mean, um, um, which of course means that they're under a deception that Satan has clouded their minds that they think that they are better than they are. Now, Jones is going to elaborate in these next few studies on the nature of Christ. But he has, he has put this in a context, both in the 1893 General Conference Bulletins and now in the 1895, put this within the context of the issue of the Sunday law. So the seal of God, which is, of course, the Sabbath, which is related to our characters, um, obviously comes at a time uh, in connection with the Sunday law. So going over what Jones is going to read, anybody who has questions or comments, feel free to comment. I'll make the odd comment of things that come to my mind that I think I need to point out or things that are clear, especially things that I think relate to this movement. Uh, because one of the things we see is that Jones is in a history that is paralleling our history. It's paralleling our repeat of history in that 
he believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down already in his time. And we have that marked at 9-11. Okay, so Jones begins. You will remember the point that was made in one of Brother Prescott's lessons when he called attention to the book of Ruth. Now, we didn't read that, but anybody could find that online. Uh, if you look at the 1895 General Conference Bulletin articles and you look for uh, Brother Prescott's articles. And there was other articles. And it's interesting at this time, uh, Prescott has basically been hanging on Jones and Wagner's coattails uh, in the 90s. And he appears to be presenting things that are true. And I'm not sure where Prescott got off track. Um, I think it was partly political issues that arose that got him off track. Um, I have read a lot of Prescott's works from this period, and he he seems to be obviously agreeing with Jones and Wagner, but his presentations aren't as insightful, at least from my perspective. And, and this was before I knew anything about Prescott's later history. Uh, so back in the early 1980s, I began reading Jones and Wagner and Prescott, I read a lot of his articles and his sermons. And I wasn't particularly impressed. That is, I just didn't feel that he was really understanding what he was presenting. But, and, and it wasn't of any kind of bias. I didn't have any biases against him. So I'm not sure if it was just some impression from the Holy Spirit or whatever. But anyway, that's that's just mentioning here Prescott. We know his later history is, is definitely off track. <clears throat> Who was the redeemer in the book of Ruth? The nearest of kin, Boaz, could not come in as a redeemer until it was found that the one who was nearer than he could not perform the office of redeemer. Uh, the redeemer must not only be one who was near of kin, but he must be the nearest among those who were near. And therefore, Boaz could not step into the place of redeemer until by another's stepping out of the place, he became really the nearest. Now, that is the precise point that is made in the second chapter of Hebrews. Now, as, as far as um, this redeemer, this has to do with the inheritance. And Jones is going to explain this a little bit. Um, now, is interesting because I was at my family reunion on the weekend, and um, that's the Ward family reunion. Wards you go back a long ways. My great, 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 I think. Grand, uh, grandfather Jonathan Ward came over before the Mayflower into the United States. And he was baptized when he was 100 years old. So, um, but anyway, um, my grandmother, who's passed away, obviously, um, she she was married and her husband died and uh, she had a daughter. And so um, obviously back then, it's pretty difficult to be a single mom. And so my grandfather um, uh, chose to marry my grandmother because his brother was married to my grandmother's sister. And so... In a sense, he's kind of the nearest of kin. I mean, he's somebody who's uh, had an opportunity to help his uh, brother's sister-in-law by marrying her so she wouldn't be a single mom. And uh, they weren't married for 70 years or something like that. Um, but anyway, so this kind of reminds me of that. So these types of situations happen. But the issue here has to do with his inheritance, right? In Ruth, you remember, Naomi's husband had died. The inheritance had fallen into the hands of others. And when she came back from Moab, it had to be redeemed. No one but the nearest of kin could do it. This is the story also of the second of Hebrews. Here is the man, Adam, who had an inheritance, the earth, and he lost it. And he himself was brought into bondage. In the gospel, in Leviticus, it is preached that if one had lost his inheritance, himself and his inheritance could be redeemed, but only the nearest of kin could redeem it. So he gives us Leviticus 25 and 25, verse 25 and 26 of Leviticus 25 and 47 to 49. Upon earth here is a man, 
Adam, who lost his inheritance and himself, right? So basically he's into bondage. And you and I were in it all, and we need a redeemer. But only he who is nearest in blood relationship can perform the office of redeemer. Jesus Christ is nearer than a brother, nearer than anyone. He is a brother, but he is nearest among the brethren, nearest of kin, actually. Not only one with us, but he is one of us and one with us by being one of us. And the one lesson that we are studying still and the leading thought is how entirely Jesus is ourselves. We found in the preceding lesson that he is altogether ourselves in all points of temptation, wherever we are tempted. He was our, ourselves right there. In all the points in which it is possible for me to be tempted, he, as I, stood right there against all the knowledge and ingenuity of Satan to tempt me. Jesus, myself, stood right there and met it against all the power of Satan put forth in the temptation upon me. Jesus stood as myself and overcame. So also with you and so with the other man and thus comprehending the whole human race. He stands in every point wherever any one of the human race can be tempted as in himself or from himself. In all this, he is ourselves, and in him we are complete against the power of temptation. In him, we are overcomers, because he, as we, overcame. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And in noticing the other evening how he became one of us, we found that it was by birth from the flesh. He is the seed of David, according to the flesh. He took not the nature of angels, but the nature of the seed of Abraham and his genealogy goes to Adam. Now, one of the things here, um, when we when we look at this, we need to understand what it means that Jesus was the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, we know in 1 John, uh, uh, it talks about Antichrist. Right? And this idea of antichrist, um, it, it mentions it in 1 John chapter 2 and also uh, chapter 4, but I think it's this one. Um, I'm just going to read these here. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that antichrist shall come, even now there are many antichrists, whereby we, we may know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. But for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Now, what is an unction? People sometimes say they have an unction. Probably like a hunch, maybe a hunch. Well, no, it's not a hunch. Um, the word yeah, means like an unguent, which I don't know what that is, or a smearing. That is an anointment, an endowment, a special endowment, a chrism of the Holy Spirit. It's that is we're anointed. So, so there's an anointing that comes, but you have an unction from the Holy One. And ye know all things. And I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no one, no lie is of the tr truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the, not the Father, Right. So um, so we have that idea. And if we go to chapter four, it talks about testing the spirits. So first John chapter four, beloved, believe not every spirit, uh, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh 
is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ in, is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And ne even now already is it in the world. Now, the thing is, there's many people who, who confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, but they don't really mean it. There's many people who say Jesus had a sinful human nature. There's many people who say Jesus had the same nature you and I have. Some, you know, will say it, even the nature of Adam, but they don't really mean it. That is, they don't really understand what it means. Um, and so we, we saw that with Parminder, that he really denied that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. He didn't want to touch that issue. He just wanted Jesus to have a sinful human body. But is a sinful human body, does that entail all that the flesh is? especially the way that Parminder uh, framed it. A, a sinful human body is just a body that's, that's corrupted because of sin, but it's nothing to do with our nature. That is, he tried to separate the body from our nature. And I don't see how you could do that. Well, I saw him do it. And, and the way he yeah. did it was to, uh, to distort, distort uh, our understanding of human nature. So he tried to make a distinction between the body and between nature. But we know that the Bible word flesh, sarx, is a word that refers to the, to the sinful human nature. It's in opposition to the spirit. Right? So, so we come in a sinful human nature. Jesus took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition, a sinful nature, but did not in the least participate in sin. So Ellen White says we should have no misgivings in regard to the sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. Not that Jesus had a sinless human nature, but that she could have said we should have no misgivings in regard to the sinlessness of the sinful nature of, human, of Jesus Christ. That is, even though he had a sinful nature, he did not sin. And of course, if you claim that the reason we sin is because we have a sinful nature, then we miss the whole point of what sin is. Sin is about the mind, not about our nature. Now, our nature can, can be subject to death. That is, we came in a nature that was guilty, that was subject to death, a nature that had to die. and We have to be redeemed from that nature. So Jones understands this, and he's going to explain this. But we can see that people often can take words and they can twist the meanings of those words to fit their theory. So people can read what Jones says here, read what Alan White says, read what the Bible says, and give it a different meaning than is intended. But I, Jones tries to make it very, very clear what he means. So he took not the nature of angels, but the nature of the seed of Abraham and his genealogy goes to Adam. <clears throat> now, every man is tempted, you know, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So that's um, James chapter one, verse 14. That is the definition of temptation. There's not a single drawing towards sin. There is not a single tendency to sin in you and me that was not in Adam when he stepped out of the garden. Now, this idea of a, a tendency, Jones is going to address that. Ellen White makes a statement, we need not retain one sinful propensity. And, and propensities and tendencies are similar. Um, uh, does anybody know what a propensity is? It, it's similar to a tendency, but it's a little stronger. That is, um, if I take my cell phone and let go of it, it's kind of hard to see there. It's got this thing there. But if I let go of it, it has a propensity to fall. Right? If nothing is holding it up, it's going to fall. 
right? That's a propensity. So if we have a sinful propensity, we will fall. But Ellen White says we need not retain one sinful propensity. Now, she doesn't say that we get rid of our sinful tendencies. Now, if if this was had a tendency to fall, this invisible cell phone, so if it had a tendency to fall, would it always fall? No. No, not always. It would just have a tendency to do that. But it wouldn't always fall. So you can have sinful tendencies and not fall. Right? So Jesus had the same nature as you and I have with its sinful tendencies. But he didn't fall because he didn't have any, any sinful propensities. And that's because it has to do with the mind, as Jones is going to show. Um, so if we go on here. Um, where was I? Okay, so there is not a single drawing towards sin in you and me that was not in Adam when he stepped out of the garden. All the iniquity and all the sin that have come into the world came from that and came from him as he was there. It did not all appear in him, it did not all manifest itself in him in open action but it has manifested itself in open action in those who have come from him so we inherited a sinful tensity a sinful tensity a per, uh, tendency pardon me a, a sinful sinful tendency but that tendency didn't have to be manifested in us right we had a tendency so he says thus all the tendencies to sin that have appeared or that are in me came from Adam and all that are in you came from Adam and all that are in the other man came from Adam. So all the tendencies to sin that are in the human race came from Adam. But Jesus Christ felt in all in these temptations. He was tempted upon all these points in the flesh, which he derived from David, from Abraham and from Adam. In his genealogy are a number of characters set forth as they were as they were lived in the man, and they were not righteous. Manasseh is there, who did worse than any other king ever in Judah, and caused Judah to do worse than the heathen. And Solomon is there in the description in, of his character in the Bible, just as it is. David is there, Rahab is there, Judah is there, Jacob is there. All are there, just as they were. Now Jesus came according to the flesh, at the end of the line of mankind, and there is such a thing as heredity. You and I have traits of character or cut of feature that have come to us from a way back, perhaps not from your own father, perhaps not from a grandfather, but from a great grandfather way back in the years. And this is referred to in the law of God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That like produces like is a good law, a righteous law. It is a law of God. And though the law be transgressed, it still does the same. Transgression of the law does not change the law, whether it be moral or physical. The law works when it is transgressed through the evil that is incurred just as it would have worked in righteousness always if no evil had ever been incur incurred. If man had rem remained righteous always as God made him, his descent would have been in the right line. When the law was transgressed, the descent followed on the wrong line and the law worked in the crooked way by its being perverted. Now, I mentioned, of course, I was at my family reunion um, this last weekend. And it's interesting how you can see the law of heredity in all these different relatives, how much alike people are, even though many of them were raised quite differently. Um, there still is a lot of not just physical characteristics, but also personality traits and habits and modes of expression and so forth. So this law of heredity is a natural law that God has created. But of course, when man transgressed, we saw that this law worked 
in a crooked way. That is, people made sin, and those sins, those characteristics, are passed on. It is a good law which says that everything shall have a tendency to go toward the center of the earth. And we could not get along in um, the world without that law. It is that which holds us upon the earth and enables us to walk and move about upon it. And if, if there be a break between us and the earth, if our feet slip out from under us, or if we be on a high station, a pinnacle, and it breaks and the straight connection with the earth is broken between us and it, why? The law works and it brings us down with a terrible jolt, jolt, you know. Well, the same law that enables us to live and move and walk around the earth as comfortably as we do, which works so beneficially while we act in harmony with it, that law continues to work when we get out of harmony with it, and it works as directly as before, but it hurts. Now, that is simply an illustration of this law of human nature. If man had remained where God put him, and as he put him, the law would have worked directly and easily, since man has got out of harmony with it. It still works directly, but it hurts. Now, that law of heredity reached from Adam to the flesh of Jesus Christ, as certainly as it reaches from Adam to the flesh of any of the rest of us, for he was one of us. In him, there were things that reached him from Adam. In him, there were things that reached him from David, from Manasseh, from the genealogy away back from the beginning until his birth. And thus, in the flesh of Jesus Christ, not in himself, but in his flesh, our flesh, which he took in the human nature, there were just the same tendencies to sin that are in you and me. And when he was tempted, it was the drawing away of these desires that were in the flesh. These tendencies to sin that were in his flesh drew upon him and sought to entice him, to consent to the wrong. But by the love of God and by his trust in God, he received the power and the strength and the grace to say no to all of it and put it all underfoot. And thus, being in the likeness of sinful flesh, he condemned sin flesh. The tendencies to sin that are in me were in him. Not one of them was ever allowed to appear in him. All the tendencies to sin that are in you were in him, and not one of them was ever allowed to appear. Everyone was put underfoot and kept there. All the tendencies to sin that are in the other man were in him, and not one of them was ever allowed to appear. That is simply saying that all the tendencies to sin that are in the hum in human flesh were in his human flesh. And not one of them was ever allowed to appear. He conquered them all. And in him, we all have victory over them all. Many of these tendencies to sin that are in us have appeared in action and have become sins committed, have become sins in the open. There is a difference between a tendency to sin and the open appearing of sin in the actions. There are tendencies to sin in us that have not yet appeared but multitudes have appeared. Now, all the tendencies that have not appeared, he conquered. What of the sins, what of, what of the sins that have actually appeared? So what, it, what, is, what happens to this? What of the sins that have actually appeared? Those sins that have appeared in us. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53, 6 who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, 1 Peter 2, 24. Thus it is plain that all the tendencies to sin that are in us and have not appeared, and all the sins which have appeared, were laid upon him. It is terrible. It is true. But, oh joy, in that terrible truth lies the completeness of our salvation. Note another view. Those sins which we have committed, we ourselves felt the guilt of them and were conscious of condemnation because of them. These were all imputed to him. They were all laid upon him. Now a question. Did he feel the guilt of the sins that were imputed to him? 
Was he conscious of the condemnation of the sins, our sins that were laid upon him? He never was conscious of sins that he committed, for he did not commit any. That is true. But our sins were laid upon him, and we were guilty. Did he realize the guilt of these sins? Was he conscious of the condemnation because of these sins? So this is the point that I was bringing out, that Jesus felt the guilt of the sins that we committed. And there is in um, uh, a discussion that went on between G.I. Butler and E.J. Wagner in the book, the two books on Galatians, where G.I. Butler makes the argument that Jesus uh, never felt guilt. He wasn't under the law until the cross. Because he that's holy and undefiled and separate from sinners, how could he feel guilt? But, of course, G.I. Butler admits that he felt guilt upon the cross. And so Wagner argues if he could have feel guilt at one time of his, in his life, why couldn't he feel it the whole time of his life? And then he shows that actually he did feel guilt his whole life. So on the cross... It's not like he felt guilt for the first time. What he felt was the complete separation from God because of that guilt. So he had experienced his guilt his whole life. Even when falsely accused, he felt guilty. But on the cross, he now was treated as a sinner. His father separated from him. <clears throat> So this is a very important point in understanding righteousness by faith. And I've run into many people, conservative Adventists, Ron Spear, as an example, who used to run Hope International and, and um, the, our firm foundation magazine that Jeff Pippinger used to work for. Um, when I presented this to him, he wasn't re he didn't know I was quoting uh, A.T. Jones and, and he was really insulted. And he said, you know, what you're teaching is error. You need to stop teaching it. And I said, I was just quoting A.T. Jones, who he professed to believe in his writings. So, <clears throat> um, so this is an important point that we often don't understand. And if we don't understand this point, it would be difficult to understand how Jesus is our example of righteousness by faith. So it's one thing to believe that Jesus is our example of how we have to live. That is, he's an example of the righteousness that we need. But the thing is, we need to know how to attain to that righteousness, which is by faith. And so if we just think he's our example in righteousness, but he's not our example in faith to obtain that righteousness, we're going to become very discouraged. Because without that faith that Jesus had, that is, he saw himself as a sinner, but knew he was righteous. He felt guilt, but he knew by faith that he was the son of God. That is the type of faith that we need. And that's what Jesus brings to us. The faith Jones of goes God. On. What's that? So here are they that have the faith of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, the, the faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus. If, Right. It's, and it's not faith of, in Jesus. It's the faith of Jesus. That is, we need the same type of faith that he had. Which is to believe in the word of God in spite of what you see, especially regarding yourself. So Jones goes on. We will look at that in such a way that every soul in the house shall say, yes, I will say that another way. We will look at it in such a way that every soul in the house will either say yes or may say yes, if you will, because there may be some in the house who have not had the experience that I will bring for the illustration. But many have have it, and then they can say yes. All others who have had the experience will say yes at once. <clears throat> God imputes righteousness the righteousness of Christ, unto the believing sinner. Here is a man who has never known anything in his life but sin, never anything but the guilt of sin, never anything but the condemnation of sin. 
That man believes on Jesus Christ, and God imputes to that man the righteousness of Christ. Then that man who never committed a particle of righteousness in his life is conscious of righteousness. Something has entered his life that was never there before. He is conscious of it, and he is conscious of the joy of it and the freedom of it. Now, God imputed our sins to Jesus Christ as certainly as he imputes his righteousness to us. But when he imputes righteousness to us who are nothing but sinners, we realize it and are conscious of it and conscious of the joy of it. Therefore, when he imputed our sins to Jesus, he was conscious of the guilt of them and the condemnation of them, just as certainly as the believing sinner is conscious of the righteousness of Christ and the peace and joy of it that is imputed to him, that is, that is laid upon him. Now, of course, you know, many of us can know of this experience that when we came to God and we felt as a sinner, we felt peace with God. We felt the joy of this freedom from sin. Doesn't mean we saw ourselves as righteous all of a sudden. In fact, we didn't see ourselves as righteous at all because we just came to God as sinners, but we could still experience the peace and the righteousness of Christ. And so Jones is saying, just as we can do that, Christ could also experience our guilt by taking upon himself our nature. In all this also, Jesus was precisely ourselves, or in all points, he was truly made like unto us. In all points of temptation, he was ourselves. He was one of us in the flesh. He was ourselves, and thus he was ourselves in temptation and in points, in guilt, and in condemnation, he was precisely ourselves because it was our sins, our guilt, and our condemnation that were laid upon him. Now, another thing upon what we have said, our sins, how many of them? All were laid upon him, and he carried the guilt and the condemnation of them all, and also answered for them, paid for them, atoned for them, then in him we are free from every sin that we have ever committed. That is the truth. Let us be glad of it and praise God with everlasting joy. He took all the sins which we have committed. He answered for them and took them away from us forever. And all the tendencies to sin which have not appeared in actual sins, these he put forever underfoot. Thus he sweeps the whole board, and we are free and complete in him. Oh, he is a complete savior. He is a savior from sins committed and the conqueror of the tendency, tendencies to commit sins. In him, we have the victory. We are no more responsible for these tendencies being in us than we are responsible for the sun shining. But every man on earth is responsible for these things appearing in open action in him. Because Jesus, and that probably shouldn't put that uh, is a capital H there. If you see that there, it should be open action in, him, in himself, talking about us. Because Jesus Christ has made provision against their ever, and that should be uh, their ever appearing in open action. Yeah, there, that is those tendencies appearing in open action before we learned of christ many of them had appeared in open action the lord hath laid upon him all these and he has taken them away and since we learned of christ these tendencies which have not appeared he condemned as sins in the flesh and shall he who believes in jesus again i don't know why they would put a capital h there and shall he who believes in Jesus allow that which Christ condemned in the flesh to rule over him in the flesh? And again, I think that should be a smaller H. Um, unless I'm misunderstanding how they're using this. But anyway, this is the victory that belongs to the believer in Jesus. It is true that although a man may have all this in Jesus, he cannot profit by it without himself being a believer in Jesus. Take the man who does not believe in Jesus at all tonight. 
Has not Christ made all the provision for him that he has for Elijah, who is in heaven tonight? And if this man wants to have Christ for his savior, if he wants provision made for all his sins and salvation from all of them, does Christ have to do anything now in order to provide for this man's sins or to save him from them? No, that is all done. He made all that provision for every man when he was in the flesh. And every man who believes in him receives this without there being any need of any part of it being done over again. He made one sacrifice for sins forever. And having by himself purged us from our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Thus, it is all in him. And every believer in him possesses it all in him and in him is complete. It is in him and that is the blessedness of it. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And God gives his eternal spirit and us eternal life, eternity in which to live. In order that that, in order that, that eternal spirit may reveal to us and make known to us the eternal depths of the salvation that we have in him, whose goings forth have been from the days of eternity. Now let us look at it another way. Turn to Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, leaving out the verses in parentheses for the moment and reading them afterward, read the 18th verse. Uh, Therefore, as by the offense of one, that, that man that sinned, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so. Uh, okay, so now leaving out the verses and reading them afterward. Okay, so we're going to read it first without the verses without the parts in parentheses, so just the verse. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, that man, that man that sinned, or I shouldn't read that, by all men, one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So, he added this, these parentheses to give it clarification. So he says, therefore, by the offense of one, that man that sinned, right? So we know that would be Adam. Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, that man that did not sin, Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, that's the man that sinned, that's Adam's, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, that man that did not sin, Christ, shall many be made righteous. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. So Jones is going to explain this. He says, Adam then was the figure of him that was to come. That one to come is Christ. Adam was the figure of him. It is a type, right? We could say he's a type. Wherein was Adam the figure of him? In his righteousness? No, for he did not keep it. In his sin? No, for Christ did not sin. Wherein then was Adam the figure of of Christ in this, that all that were in the world were included in Adam and all that are in the world are included in Christ. In other words, Adam in his sin reached all the world. Jesus Christ, the second Adam in his righteousness touches all humanity. That is where Adam is the figure of him that was to come. Now, just to comment on this. So some of you may be familiar with the 1888 message study committee and um, it started out fairly good we had um, uh, um, trying to think of the guy's names there was uh, Donald K. Short 
and um, Robert Wieland. These are the main uh, characters. They were both missionaries to Africa. And um, uh, and I don't remember. Basically, they filed a minority report when they examined the 1888 message. And they uh, ended up with this idea that the church needs to repent of its rejection of the 1888 message. Um, but they had a um, follower, and I'm trying to think of his name. I always get it. It's uh, somebody knows it, um, who wrote a book um, dealing with this idea that that Jesus died for all men, that he justified every man. Are you speaking of Jack Sequeira? Yeah, Jack Sequeira. Yeah, Jack Sequeira. So, so he was teaching this, and I never saw it in Whelan's writings or Short's writings until after Jack Sequeira started teaching this, and it and it they sort of seemed to support it. Support it, at least Whelan did. Um, but you know, Wieland was pretty old by then. I'm not sure if he really understood what was happening because uh, it didn't really fit with what uh, Robert Wieland was teaching prior to that. Um, so maybe Jack Sequeira had persuaded him, but it's not something I ever found in Jones and Wagner's writings. But statements like that we have here, um, where it says that uh, just as Adam sin reached all the world, Jesus Christ, the second Adam in his righteousness, touches all humanity. And they will use statements like this to say that Jones and Wagner supported the idea that every man was justified. But that's not what he's saying. His righteousness touches all humanity. But not all men are justified because justification is uh, occurs only in cooperation with Christ. So somebody who's not cooperating with Christ even though the provision was made, uh, that person is not justified. And, and this use of this word and this twisting of scripture led to all kinds of errors, which would, could easily be seen in the followers of Jack Secura and how they acted and what they believed. And this was sort of the same thing with Parminder. And, and I should have been more aware of it at the time, because at first, when I saw all of these followers of Parminder, manifesting uh, what I thought was a misrepresentation of what Parminder was teaching. That is, I thought that they didn't understand it and that that they didn't see themselves as sinners anymore and that this was from Parminder's teaching. I just thought the problem was with them. But later I came to realize it was actually the fruit of Parminder's teaching. So sometimes in order to understand what somebody's teaching is you have to see the effect that it has upon the majority of those who are following that teacher. So if somebody's teaching error in regard to salvation, it will be manifest in the lives of those who believe that error. So anyway, uh, so Joan says to read on, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. It's kind of an odd sentence, but... Um, for if through the offense of one, one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. There are two men, then, whom we are studying. That one man by whom sin entered. That one man by whom righteousness entered. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, that is, by the first Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Read another text in connection with this before we touch the particular study of it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. So it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening or life-giving spirit. 
Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As in the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as in the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The first Adam touched all of us, and what he did included all of us. If he had remained true to God, that would have included all of us. And when he fell away from God, that included us and took us also. Whatever he should have done embraced us, and what he did made us what we are. Now here is another Adam. Does he touch as many as the first Adam did? That is the question. That is what we are studying now. Does the second Adam touch as many as did the first Adam? And the answer is that it is certainly true that what the second Adam did embraces all that were embraced in what the first Adam did. What he should have done, what he could have done, would embrace all. Suppose Christ had yielded temptation and had sinned. Would that have meant anything to us? It would have meant everything to us. The first Adam's sin meant all this to us. Sin in the part of the second Adam would have meant all this to us. The first Adam's righteousness would have meant all to us. And the second Adam's righteousness means all to as many as believe. That is correct in a certain sense, but not in the sense in which we are studying it now. We are now studying from the side of the Adams, and we will look at it from our side presently. So he's really going to be addressing this point, though he doesn't know what Jack Secure was teaching because it's 100 years later. But um, we'll go on. The question is, does the second Adam's righteousness embrace as many as does the first Adam's sin? Well, closely, without our consent at all, without our having anything to do with it, we were all included in the first Adam. We were there. All the human race were in the first Adam. What that first Adam, what that first man did meant us, it involved us. And that which the first Adam did brought us into sin. And the end of sin is death. And that touches every one of us and involves every one of us. Jesus Christ, the second man, took our sinful nature. He touched us in all points. He became we and died the death. And so in him and by him, or in him and by that, every man that has ever lived upon the earth and was involved in the first Adam is involved in this and will live again. There will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just, those that are justified, and both of the unjust, those that are not justified. I'm adding that <clears throat> justified and unjustified. Every soul shall live again by the second Adam from the death that came by the first Adam. So Jones is quite clear that what Jesus did is going to affect every man. But it doesn't mean that all men are justified. So he goes on, well, says one, we are involved in the other sins beside that one, not without our choice. When God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, he set every man free to choose which master he would serve. And since that, every man has sinned in this world. Every man that has sinned in this world has done it because he chose to. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Not them who had no chance to believe. The God of this world blinds no man until he has shut his eyes of faith. When he shuts his eyes of faith, then Satan will see that they are kept shut as long as possible. I read the text again. If our gospel, the everlasting gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is 
Christ in you, the hope of glory, from the days of the first Adam's sin unto now, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. It is hid to them in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds. And why did he blind the minds? Because they believe not. Abraham, a heathen, born a heathen, as all the rest of us are, and raised a heathen, grew up in a family of heathens, worshiping idols and the heavenly host. He turned from it all unto God and opened his eyes of faith and used them. And Satan never had a chance to blind his eyes. And Abraham, a heathen, thus turning from among heathens unto God and finding God in Jesus Christ in the fullness of hope. That is one reason why God has set him before all the world. He is an example of what every heathen on this earth may find. He is a God set forth example of how every heathen is without excuse if he does not find God in Jesus Christ by the everlasting gospel. Abraham is set before all nations in witness of the fact that every heathen is responsible in his own way if he does not find what Abraham found. Therefore, just as far as the first Adam reaches man, so far the second Adam reaches man. The first Adam brought man under the condemnation of sin, even unto death. The second Adam's righteousness undoes that and makes every man live again. As soon as Adam sinned, God gave him a second chance and set him free to choose which master he would have. Since that time, every man is free to choose which way he will go. Therefore, he is responsible for his own individual sins. And when Jesus Christ has set us all free from the sin and the death, which came upon us from the first Adam, that freedom is for every man and every man can have it for the choosing. Right. So you can see that this completely departs from Jack Sakira's teaching. Right. We have the ability to choose. But that doesn't make us all justified. The Lord will not compel anyone to take it. He compels no one to sin, and he compels no one to be righteous. Everyone sins upon his own choice. The scriptures demonstrate it, and everyone can be made perfectly righteous at his choice. And the scriptures demonstrate this. No man will die the second death who has not chosen sin rather than righteousness, death rather than life. In Jesus Christ, there is furnished in completeness all that man needs or ever can have in righteousness. And all there, and all there is for any man to do is to choose Christ, and then it is his. And as the first Adam was, we, the second Adam is we. In all points, he is as weak as are we. Read two texts. He says of us, without me, he can do nothing. Of himself, he says, of mine own self, I can do nothing. These two texts are all we want now. They tell the whole story. To be without Christ is to be without God. And there the man can do nothing. He is utterly helpless of himself and in himself. That is where the man who is, who is without God. Jesus Christ says, of mine own self, I can do nothing. Then that shows that the Lord Jesus put himself in this world, in the flesh, in his human nature. Precisely where the man is in this world who is without God. He put himself precisely where lost man is. He left out his divine self and became we. There, helpless, as we are without God, he ran the risk of getting back to where God is and bringing us with him. It was a fearful risk. But, glory to God, he won. The thing was accomplished, and in him we are saved. When he stood where we are, he said, I will put my trust in him. And that trust was never disappointed. In response to that trust, the Father dwelt in him, and with him, and kept him from sinning. Who was he? We. And thus the Lord Jesus has brought to every man in this world divine faith. 
That is the faith of the Lord Jesus. That is saving faith. Faith is not something that comes from ourselves with which we believe upon him, but it is that something with which he believed, the faith which he exercised, which he brings to us and which becomes ours and works in us, the gift of God. That is what the word means, here are they, that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They keep the faith of Jesus because it is that defined faith which Jesus exercised himself. He being we brought to us that divine faith which saves the soul, that divine faith by which we can say with him, I will put my trust in him. And in so putting our trust in him, that trust today will never be disappointed any more than it was then. God responded then to the trust and dwelt with him. God will respond today to that trust in us and will dwell with us. God dwelt with him and he was ourselves. Therefore, his name is Emmanuel, God with us, not God with him. God was with him before the world was and he could have remained there and not come here at all. And still God would have remained with him and his name could have been God with him. He could have come into this world as he was in heaven and his name's could still have been God with him, but that, but that never could have been God with us. But what we needed was God with us. God with him does not help us unless he is we. But that is the blessedness of it. He who was one with God became one of us. He who was God became we in order that God with him should be God with us. Oh, that is his name. That is his name. Rejoice in that name forevermore. God with us. So a very powerful message. And any thoughts? I think it's quite clear what Jones is saying. Um, now, I'm going to ask a question. In this lesson, is this a new idea that has come to people? Or is there, is there a time when this, I mean, maybe this idea has been around for a while in your mind. But do you see how people don't understand what Jones just explained as Seventh-day Adventists? That as Seventh-day Adventists, we can believe all the doctrines of Adventism, but not this particular doctrine. And you can see how they can be easily be twisted. Yes, it has been twisted. And, and of course, to say it's easily twisted, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to bring up a question that was that was brought up uh, earlier before we had this. Um, so some of you weren't here. Uh, I think it was just William and Orion and myself. Um, but um, a question was brought up regarding the statement, uh, this statement here. So I'm going to bring it up. Now, you can, of course, see, since this is in the LNG white disk, um, so I'll just share the screen here. So I'm just going to address that point that you just made. <clears throat> now, this is a statement, and I've had this statement presented to me many times, where people think that this is Ellen White making a statement. This is actually Willie White making this statement. You can see it's not in black, it's in blue. Um, I've had people in this movement bring it up, some uh, even after July 18th, some before, um, thinking it was an Ellen White statement. Um, but here's, here's the statement. And I want you to look at the argument that's presented. That's going to address what you were saying there, Jeff. It seems to me there's a danger of placing altogether too much stress upon chronology. If it had been essential to the salvation of man that he should have a clear and harmonious understanding of the chronology of the world, the Lord would not have permitted the disagreements and discrepancies which we find in the writings of the Bible historians. And it seems to me that in these last days, there ought not to be so much controversy regarding dates. 
Now, of course, if Ellen White had said this, this would not have been a logical thing to say. So first off, what is his argument of why we shouldn't stress, uh, put an emphasis upon chronology? What's the argument? Division, right? And so the argument is, if something is true or something is important, if it's essential to the salvation of man, we shouldn't have disagreements about it. God wouldn't have permitted us to disagree and we wouldn't have these discrepancies in all of these different writers in Adventism, right? Now you can see he's applying it here to chronology, but what if you applied this to the Sabbath or to the nature of Christ or to the daily? Do you, you see what the argument is that he's making? And, and so Jeff had said, you know, it's easily can be distorted, right? The teachings that what Jones presents. But I don't think it's actually easy to somebody who is interested in truth. I mean, he, yeah, he's, he's clear. Jones is clear, definitely. No. But everything, in a sense, can be distorted, no matter how clear it is presented. Because when yeah. Jesus taught when he was here upon earth, was he clear? Did he say things in such a way that it was easy for it to be distorted? And I'm not saying that you're you know, making a, a claim that, you know, Jones is doing something wrong here. But Jones is presenting things as clear as humanly possible, as clear as, as language can allow. But to a person who, has, who is in darkness, who does not love light, who does not love truth, who doesn't want that light to shine in the darkness and show him his sins. For humanity, the easiest thing to do, it's not really the easiest, but it's the easiest to the man who wants to stay in darkness, is to distort what's being presented. And so we know that the truth will always have disagreements and always there will be people presenting discrepancies. They do that with Paul's writings, too. Yeah, well, we say the same things about Paul's writings. In his writings are things, you know, hard to be understood, that th those that are stable and unlearned twist or rest to their own destruction. And so his argument that, that Willie White is making here is, is, is a very bad argument. We should never use this type of argument against something that we don't have arguments for. This is a lazy man's argument. You know, needs to be easy to understand. Present something that's easy to be understand. A child should be able to understand it. And your stuff is too complicated. You know, I don't like it because I don't like math. You know, math is too hard. But that's not an argument against the truth because with the truth is something that is very hard it's called the cross of christ every time you're faced with the truth you're faced with a cross something that is extremely difficult impossible without christ to even bear that cross and so we know that what jones is presenting is the truth but our human nature does not want us to know this truth. That's the problem. That's the problem that Jones faced, not just from outside, but even within ourselves. Even if we can present the truth, Jones presented the truth. And he lived it for a time and he fell away. And I believe that he, he came back to God. I don't know. He came back to God. I guess well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my understanding of it. I mean, it's not like he went into open sin or anything like that. He he just uh, he got very discouraged, got very self defensive. Uh, all the opposition led to the church disfellowshipping him, 
because he, he, he started to go to extremes to try to, in a sense, force people to be righteous. He wanted to, the, these things to end. And, and yet, you know, he basically struck the rock twice, just like Moses. So anyway, uh, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the study here this evening, uh, for the truths of the gospel, for the example of faith, not just of righteousness and obedience that Christ presents to us. Would we give our hearts to you even though they are nothing, they're all we have. And we ask, Lord, that you can renew our hearts, that you can take our sinful heart, our heart of stone, and make it a heart of flesh, that you can write your law upon our inward parts. We confess our sins, Lord. We know we need you. And we pray for each other. Thank you for the Sabbath. Bless each person. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.